I thought I could be more useful alive, but to you, God, I give all the glory of whatever happens. The Andaman Islands, a secluded tropical archipelago in the Indian Ocean, it remained largely unknown to the world until 2018. It suddenly rose to global fame thanks to John Allen Chow. He was a 26-year-old American missionary who set foot on North Sentinel Island. This tiny piece of land is home to a tribe of hunter-gatherers who live in complete isolation. The tribe is known to outsiders as the Sentinelese and they live a life shrouded in complete mystery. We don't know what they call themselves or what language they speak. Chances are we may never find out. Before I go on and talk about what happened after John Chow set foot on the island, I should probably clarify why he ended up there in the first place. Chow was raised in a Christian home. His family were members of the Assemblies of God. This is an international Pentecostal church known for practices like speaking in tongues. This branch of Christianity has mega churches all over the world. Big business, big money, private jets, mansions and zero tax. One day as a small kid, Chow was rooting through his father's study when he found something tempting. It was an illustrated edition of Robinson Crusoe, the classic story of a sailor shipwrecked on a deserted island. After struggling my way to read it with early elementary school English, he later shared on a website for outdoor enthusiasts, I started reading easier, kid-friendly books. Another one of those books was The Sign of the Beaver. This inspired both John and his brother to paint their faces with wild blackberry juice and then tramped through their backyard with bows and spears they created from sticks. It may sound like it's a lot of fun, and I dare say it was, but these very early interactions would shape Chow's personality and lead his life down a very unexpected path. With that being said, his adventurous spirit wasn't limited to his backyard. His Instagram has two particular posts from August 22nd, 2014, which feature pictures from 2003 with his family at Yellowstone National Park and Mount Hood. He was adventurous for as far back as we can see. As time passed, Chow became more and more obsessed with religion, so perhaps it doesn't come as a surprise. As his personality seemed destined for missionary work, he was God-fearing, adventurous and driven to the extreme. John was no stranger to travelling or to the dangers that it can bring. His Instagram account captures all of his epic journeys. In May of 2017, whilst in Northern California, he was bitten by a rattlesnake. This led to a relatively long hospital stay and multiple doses of antivenom. John escaped with his leg intact, although he didn't escape the pain and the swelling. On this account, we can also see that he is a self-described wilderness EMT, a PADI advanced open water diver, an outbound collective explorer, a perky jerky ambassador, this looks like some sort of influencer type deal, and finally, as we now know, a snake bite survivor. On his website, John shares stories of his expeditions in his blog. However, as much as I would love to share some with you, as of the time of this video being made, all of the links to the individual posts are dead. What we do know is that he was a dedicated adventurer and a passionate Christian. It appears as though he made his travels his business. During high school, he first read about the Sentinelese on a missionary database called the Joshua Project. The website described the Sentinelese as extremely isolated and it noted that the Indian government bans access to North Sentinel Island. The ban is for the sake of everyone involved. The indigenous people of the island need protecting from outside diseases. A simple cold could wipe them out. They were hoping that the Indian government would one day allow Christians to earn the trust of the Sentinelese people and live among them. The websites also mention that in addition to basic medical care, the Sentinelese need to know that the Creator God exists and that He loves them and paid the price for their sins. Many people, including Christian organisations and John Chow's own father, would blame the American missionary community for what happened next.
In October of 2018, John travelled on a tourist visa to Port Blair, the regional capital of the Andaman Islands, and there he stayed in what is described as a safe house. There, he made an initial contact response kit that included picture cards for communication, bandages, dental forceps for removing arrows, and gifts for the Sentinelese people such as tweezers, scissors, cord, safety pins and fishing hooks. Hoping to lessen the risk of accidentally infecting the Sentinelese, he entered a self-imposed quarantine. For 11 days, he hid and went without direct sunlight. During this time, he prayed, he exercised, and he read The Lives of the Three Mrs. Judsons, a 19th century missionary account. Upon leaving the safe house, John wrote this in his diary, On the island of life, into your hands, Father, into your hands. I will not lose sight of the prize and protecting and blessing you. You will direct my path, praying all my heart's plans will succeed. You, Jesus, are to be prayed. Soli Deo Gloria. On the night of November the 14th, he and some fishermen set out for North Sentinel Island. On the boat to the island, as he was travelling at night to avoid detection by authorities, John wrote about seeing bioluminescent plankton under a canopy of stars. He said he saw fish jumping in and out of the water like darting mermaids. The mission wasn't as easy as walking onto the island and speaking with its people. Instead, John and the bribed fishermen had to dodge authorities to avoid arrest. As well as this, as I said before, the Sentinelese people did not want any visitors. They had their own lives and chose isolation from the rest of the world. And honestly, I can see why. John would have to sit on a boat, watching the tree lines and high ground for any signs of human life. When the time is right, he would leave the vessel and approach the shore. This is an excerpt from his diary. Currently on the boat, watching to make contact. Left last night at around 18.30 and arrived at around 22.30 or so. But as we were along the eastern shore, we saw boat lights in the distance along the northern shore and turned around. We headed south along the eastern shore and circled, then went along the southern shore. The Milky Way was above and God himself was shielding us from the Coast Guard and any retaliation. At 4.30am we entered the cove on the western side and as the sun began to rise, we saw the east side of the island revealed. Two of the guys jumped in the shallows and brought my two pelicans and kayak onto the northern point of the cove. The dead coral is sharp and I already got a slight scratch on my right leg. The pelicans he's referring to here are waterproof pelican or peli cases. He used these to store supplies and gifts. The right moment came and John made his move. I'm sure this isn't what he envisaged. This is what he wrote in his diary at 10am on November the 15th. I began rowing to the house we had seen about a mile and a half or so away, on the top of the dead coral in four foot of water. As I was about 400 yards out, I heard women chattering. Then I spotted two dugout canoes with outriggers. I rowed to the shore and saw movement on the shore. Two armed Sentinelese came rushing out and yelled at me. They had two arrows each, unstrung until I got closer. I hollered. My name is John, I love you and Jesus loves you. Jesus Christ gave me authority to come to you here with some fish. I kept yelling at them and they began to string their arrows. I threw the fish towards them, they kept coming. Then I slid the barracuda off and it started to sink below my kayak. My thoughts were directed towards the fact that I was almost in arrow's range. I back paddled facing them and when they got the fish, I turned and paddled like I never have in my life back to the boat. I felt some fear but mainly was disappointed they didn't accept me right away. I can now say I have been nearly shot by the Sentinelese but I believe I was laughing and caught their attention. Their arrows mostly drew back and the bows weren't great. I paddled to the cove past the rocks and hurried to write this note. John regrouped and decided to approach the Sentinelese once more. At 1.30pm on the same day, he wrote about what had just happened to him. This was after his second attempt. Well, I've been shot by the Sentinelese, by a kid probably about 10 or so years old, possibly a teenager. Shorts compared to those who looked like adults. 
I got back up after that initial contact to show them my boat and the fish I caught that looks like a grouper or snapper with big lips. Each weighed about 30 pounds. I set off towards the north shore of the cove, towards where I'd seen a dilapidated structure and two destroyed dugouts via binoculars. Why was it dilapidated? Perhaps a death. Then seeing no one from the water, I unloaded my kayak through the shallows of the dead coral reef and I didn't see anyone. I proceeded around the cove towards a hut I had been chased from in my initial contact. And sure enough, as I got closer, I heard women and shouts from near the hut. I heard the whoops out of arrow range, but I made sure to stay closer and keep out of good hearing range. That means that about one time there were about six of them from what I could see. I started to parrot their words back to me, yelling most of the time. They were laughing, saying bad words or insulting me, and so they probably hid behind the hut which they were also yelling about. They approached me and I whooped back. They kept their distance. The only one yelling at me looked fairly juvenile. I spotted one wearing a white crown of something, flowers maybe, on his head and he also took a seemingly leadership stance. He was tallest and seemed to climb a rock to yell. I yelled some phrases and sang some worship songs and hymns and they dropped their bows and stopped yelling. Then two of them dropped their bows and arrows and took steps towards me. I couldn't tell if they were truly unarmed or not but I stayed out of arrow range and I dropped off the fish and gifts and at first they picked their dugouts past the gifts and weapons were aimed at me then they turned except for two who stayed. I paddled after them, saw some more gifts of pencils and exchanged them on the shore, paddled out after an hour. I knew this nice meet and greet wasn't going to end well. With that scared child and a young woman with a bow and arrow in the canoe behind me, I kept waving my hands to show I wasn't going to run, but they didn't seem to understand. I paddled to the boat, seeing about three or four arrows from a distance of the tree above their head. This was a friendly distance between them and the dugout. I grabbed my kayak and headed out. The islanders saw and blocked my exit. One blocked while other men with red cloth ran along the coast. They had two arrows each, unstrung, until I got closer and shouted my name. I stood in my kayak to show them that I too have two legs. I was inches from the unarmed guy. He was well built with a round face and yellowish pigment circles on his cheeks, and about five foot five inches. I gave him a bunch of the scissors and gifts as they got bunched together, so basically I gave them all of the gift type things, except for some spares in my cachet gear. And then they took the kayak, and the little kid shot me with an arrow. Directly into my bible which I was holding in front of my chest, I grabbed the arrow shaft. It broke in my bible in Genesis 33-23 and Isaiah 65-2. I felt the arrowhead was metal, thin but very sharp. I stumbled back and recall yelling at the kid to shoot me. As I look back at him, my bible covers look like bark, like tree bark, so maybe he was just being curious, but yikes, it sure gave me a fright. They left me alone as I half waded, half swam through the broken coral to the deep where I knew the dugouts couldn't reach me. Then I paddled this kayak out of the arrow range, I had to swim almost a mile back to the boat. After making some notes where he was trying to decipher the language and actions of the islanders, he added this emotional paragraph, watching the sunset and it's beautiful, crying a bit, wondering if it will be the last sunset I see before being in the place where the sun never sets, praising up a little. The reality of the situation suddenly seemed to drop on John, the tone of his writing changed dramatically. God, I don't want to die. Who will take my place if I do? Oh God, I miss my parents. My mom and dad and Brian and Mary and Nora and Jeremy and JD and Jennifer and Seth and Bobby, even though he was just here. And Christian and someone I can talk to and be understood. None of the guys on the boat know much English and I didn't know much Hindi or to ask their opinions and to tell stuff like this to. I've never felt this much grief or sorrow before. Why? Why did a little kid have to shoot me today? His high-pitched voice still lingers in my head, 
Father, forgive him and any of the people on this island who try to kill me. Especially forgive them if they succeed. What makes them become this defensive and hostile? Legends passed down through millennia of their escape from a slave ship. Why does this beautiful place have to have so much death? Last night I had what I'd call a vision, as I've never had one before. My eyes were shut, but I wasn't asleep. And I saw a purple hue over a great like city as a meteorite or star fell to it. And it was a frightening city with jagged spires, and I felt distressed. Then a different light, a whitish light filled it, and all the fright gets melted away. Lord, is this island Satan's last stronghold? Where none have heard or even had a chance to hear your name. Lord, strengthen me as I need your strength and protection and guidance, and all that you give and are. Whoever comes after me to take my place, whether it's after tomorrow or another time, please give them a double anointing and bless them mightily. The plan for tomorrow is to drop me at the cache, and then the boat will leave for the day. Returning at night, I'm at peace with that plan. If it goes badly on foot, the fishermen won't have to bear witness to my death. Alternative is to either wait another time and go back to Port Blair, but without any documents and stay in the safe house again and put it all at risk. Why are we so afraid of death? If I leave, I believe I would have failed the mission. Now that I remember it, after I got shot by that arrow and it was in my Bible, I gave it back. Man, I should have snapped it. Perfect love casts out fear. Lord Jesus, fill me with your perfect love for these people. The next morning at 6.20am he wrote, Woke up after a fairly restful sleep, heading to Ireland now. I hope this isn't my last note, but if it is, to God be the glory. One thought occurred to me last night. Only young adults were seen, and kids, but no elderly. Are they separated and they must stay on the shore? Are the elderly in the jungle? I'm heading back to the hut I've been to, praying all goes well. Signed, John Chow. He wrote one more thing, a letter addressed directly to his family. This would be the final page of his diary. Brian and Mary and mum and dad, you guys might think I'm crazy in all this, but I think it's worth it to declare Jesus to these people. Please do not be angry at them or at God if I get killed. Rather, please live your lives in obedience to whatever he has called you to, and I'll see you again when you pass through the veil. Don't retrieve my body. This is not a pointless thing. The eternal lives of this tribe is at hand, and I can't wait to see them around the throne of God, worshipping in their own language as Revelation 7, 9-10 to states, I love you all. And I pray none of you love anything in this world more than Jesus Christ. Soli Deo Gloria John Chow 11 16 18 6 20 a.m. On November the 21st, 2018, Dipendra Pathak, the Director General of Police in the Andamans and Nicobars, issued a press release titled Death of US National. The Andamans and Nicobars are typically peaceful, so this news was quite startling. Pathak wrote that his office in Port Blair had received an email two days earlier from the US consulate in Chennai. The consulate had been contacted by an American woman, the mother of John Allen Chow. She wanted to speak about her son's visit to the North Sentinel Island and his possible attack by the tribesmen. Upon receiving the email, the police immediately registered a missing person report and initiated a detailed search. Pathak had ordered the Coast Guard to fly over North Sentinel Island and a second group of officers to sail past in a patrol boat. But neither saw any sign of Chow. No news could be good news. However, it was statements made by five fishermen that changed everything. These were the men that agreed to take Chow to North Sentinel Island. They said they had dropped him off close to the shore and when they returned a day later they saw a dead person being buried at the shore, which from the silhouette of the body, clothing and circumstances appeared to be the body of John Allen Chow. Within hours of the search beginning, detectives reported that Chow 
allegedly got killed at North Sentinel Island during his misplaced adventure in the highly restricted area while trying to interact with the uncontacted people who have a history of vigorous rejection towards outsiders. Pathak arrested all five fishermen along with two more men from Port Blair, all of whom had helped Chow travel to North Sentinel Island despite knowing fully well about the illegality of the action and the hostile attitude of the Sentinelese tribesmen to outsiders. In their defence, the fishermen said that Chow volunteered to visit North Sentinel Island for preaching Christianity to the indigenous tribe. While it was true that no one forced him, is it really a great idea to willingly help someone reach right into the middle of an extremely aggressive tribe? Possibly not. Pathak labelled his press release as urgent, likely surprised by the global impact that it would have. Within a day, journalists around the world were covering the story of how a 26-year-old American missionary had been killed by a so-called Stone Age tribe on a remote island. Thousands of commentators weighed in, many agreeing that the idea of people still living semi-naked in the forest sustained by what they could hunt with bows and spears was enchanting, but the idea that missionaries were still venturing into the jungle to convert them was seen by most as outrageous and even potentially racist. Now, what do you think about this? Do you think that John Chow acted for a good cause, or was this purely reckless, or maybe even worse? Stephen Corey, director of the indigenous advocacy group Survival International, warned that entire populations of remote people are being wiped out by violence from outsiders who steal their land and resources, and by diseases like the flu and measles to which they have no resistance. He pointed out that Chow might have infected the Sentinelese even in death, and whereas we will never know, there is a high possibility that this could be true. He said that the Sentinelese have shown again and again that they want to be left alone. Overall, Chow's diary paints a picture of a young man obsessed with the idea of bringing Christianity to the Sentinelese, people who have lived without outside contact for centuries protected by Indian law. It also reveals that John Chow did know his mission was illegal. He wrote about evading Indian authorities who patrol the waters near the island. God himself was hiding us from the Coast Guard and many patrols. He noted about the boat journey. But to his father, John was an innocent child. He said he died from an extreme vision of Christianity taken to its logical conclusion. But after checking his blog posts and diary writings, his photos and social media, it was obvious that Chow wasn't as naive as his father thought he was. His decision to contact the Sentinelese, who have clearly shown they prefer to be left alone, was undeniably reckless. It was selfish and it was thoughtless, but it wasn't a spare of the moment act by a foolish thrill seeker. Instead, it was a calculated risk by a thoughtful and fairly intelligent thrill seeker, someone who had spent years preparing for that moment. He seemed to understand the risks, including to his own life, but he believed his purpose on earth was to bring Christ to what he considered Satan's last stronghold. And on the morning of November the 16th, after writing a few last words, his time on this earth came to an end. If he reached his next destination, we will never know.